So now in this final video on microevolution, we're going to be looking at um, natural selection, but more explicitly the role that it plays in microevolution. We'll entitle this next flowchart the uh, natural selection as an NS role in microevolution. This is a uh, one final idea to understand, and remember we have to always go back to our beginning idea of microevolution, the small scale change, the small scale change in allele frequency, um, and we're going to be looking at how natural selection plays its role. What we have to understand about natural selection first and foremost is that it, natural selection always um, acts on the phenotype. In essence, what it acts on is the expression of genes, therefore, acts on the expression, EXP for expression, of genes. So that's what natural selection acts on. It acts on whether or not a certain trait is favorable, like the trait or phenotype uh, of a certain camouflage, let's say. That's the expression of a gene, and it acts on that. Natural selection also, because it acts on this phenotype, it's going to indirectly, or actually directly, be involved in changing, and it does change the allele frequency. So it changes the allele frequency, and the reason why it does this, and we establish this in our um, Hardy-Weinberg conditions, natural selection flowchart, we stated that um, it increases ad adaptations. And if you increase adaptations, you are indirectly um, also, not indirectly, actually directly, changing allele frequencies because the ones that are better at adaptations are going to be more represented within the allele frequency. Natural selection also plays a big role in microevolution because it actually creates phenotypic variation. Okay, It aids in this idea of phenotypic variation. Remember how we talked about the types of variation that we see? Well, the phenotypic variation that we see is going to be uh, due in part to natural selection, and more specifically going to be, uh, if we look at the genetics, due to the presence, okay, due to the presence of different alleles at the corresponding loci. So because we have different alleles, you know, different alleles for a certain camouflage color over another camouflage color, we have variation at the phenotypic level. Such variation is often considered um, in two different forms. Uh, in genetics terms, we call these morphs, aka morphs can be considered um, more specifically that either-or mentality, aka we can consider these contrasting phenotypes. Morphs are considered contrasting phenotypes like the example we've been constantly using, like red versus white color in plants, let's say. One of these may be more uh, phenotypically uh, advantageous and thus um, may be more uh, present in the allele frequency of the population because it's more adaptive in nature, okay? That's two either-or morph scenarios. But then there's a bit of a more interesting and more realistic I would say scenario in which we have something known as polymorphic. So if this means contrasting phenos as in two phenotypes usually, polymorphic would mean that you would have more than two phenotypes available. So this is two, uh, usually two or more, okay? Usually more actually, two or more morphs that are seen within a population in noticeable frequencies, okay? So if you can think of a polymorphic trait that's seen within a population, let's say like the human population, can you think of a noticeable polymorphic trait? Something like height, right? There are more than two morphs of height. That is a very variable phenotypic result, and that is natural selection is specifically going to act on it in a polymorphic way. More specifically, when we talk about something that's polymorphic, we have to be sure to mention that polymorphism usually goes hand in hand with the idea of something that's very powerful and very often not touched upon as much as it should be, the idea of polygenic control. Poly means many. Genic is going to be referring to genes. Many genes are going to be controlling certain traits. For the most part, you have to understand the following. An allele at single locus, this, this sort of uh, perfect ideal uh, gen bio scenario of an allele at single locus controlling a phenotype, you know, controlling one specific phenotype like round versus wrinkled or green versus yellow. As powerful as it is, it's actually rather rare to see. It's actually rather rare to see 
in most advanced populations that an allele at a single locus controls a phenotype. This is a rarity, okay? This is not the commonality. What's actually more common is to see something that's polygenic. Not just one allele, but you're actually more likely to see the following. You are more likely you're more likely to have an interaction. This is the, the, the complexity of genetics that I really, really like. More likely to have an interaction, okay? Interaction between alleles. So some alleles will interact with others, and this interaction of alleles is going to be happening at several loci, and all of which are going to give you a polymorphic trait, a polygenic controlled trait like height. Height is a bunch of different alleles, a bunch of different um, genes that are going to be working at several different loci between each other and interacting with each other to give you a polymorphic result, a polymorphic phenotypic variable height that's seen throughout the human population. That explains, think about it, that explains why so many different heights are available. So many different heights are seen in a population. Why? Because height is polygenic. Height is polymorphic. Thus, you see many different variations of it. In addition, polygenic control is something that's going to be able to create, and it does create, a range of phenos, sort of what I've already talked about in terms of height. It creates a range of phenos, not a morph, a contrasting uh, situation like tall versus short. What we see is a more continuous continuum, like a range of phenos. Um, we can call this a continuum. This is the idea uh, that we've established before in an earlier flowchart. And what we notice about this continuum, and this is a powerful, powerful idea, is that mostly everyone in this continuum, mostly everyone, is right about at the middle, right about at the middle of this continuum. And there are um, very few at the extremes of the continuum. If you know anything about statistics, polygenic control, something that's controlled by many genes at many different loci, creating a range or a continuum like height is going to follow a distribution and we call this in statistics a normal distribution will be seen if something is controlled polygenically. A normal distribution is in essence the establishment of a bell curve and a bell curve is going to be the situation in which we see there is no selection pressure whatsoever. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. There's no selection pressure. So simply speaking, in a normal distribution, which is seen in a polygenic control, what you see is the following. You see a bell curve such as this, okay? So let's imagine that these are um, a different heights, right? And over here, we see, um, you know, basic idea of the amount of people on the y-axis. And over here, we see height. Over here, we see very short. And over here, we see NBA player tall, like seven feet. Over here, we see five feet. And we'll talk about males, let's say. The majority of males will fall underneath this middle region right here, right? They're not going to be incredibly short, nor are they going to be incredibly tall. That's what we mean by mostly everyone at the middle. Over here, we don't have that many people that are incredibly short, nor do we have that many people that are incredibly tall over here. So if this is very, very, very short, and this is very, very, very tall, we have a continuum that we see here. And most people will represent themselves in the middle, and there's no selection pressure either way. Selection, aka natural selection, is not saying that more tall people are necessary in the environment or more small people are not small short people are necessary in the environment um, or middle people it's just a normal distribution that's what we call polygenic control but where it gets interesting i think and we'll look at this in the next final video um, just so that we keep time short is when we start looking at variations of this when we start seeing natural selection say hey I'm going to put some pressure over here on this part of the on the bell curve and see how this bell curve reacts to this pressure. And that's what we'll see in our next final video on microevolution.